Good morning. Welcome. Welcome to today's oversight hearing on hiring a new chancellor and college president at the City University of New York. I'm Councilmember Inez Barron, Chair of the Committee on Higher Education. Witnesses invited to testify today on this topic include representatives from CUNY, the Professional Staff Congress, student groups, higher education advocates, and other interested parties. First, I would like to acknowledge that we're holding this hearing almost four years after this committee previously received testimony jointly with the Civil Rights Committee regarding faculty diversity at CUNY. During that hearing, we recognize that while CUNY's undergraduate student body more or less reflects the diversity of the city as a whole, its faculty and academic leadership unfortunately does not. This lack of diversity is even more profound when we look at the top governance of the institution at the chancellor and college president levels. For example, according to the most recent studies, recent student data available, as of fall 2016, 25% of CUNY undergraduates identified as black, 30% as Hispanic, 25% as Asian Pacific Islander, and 15% as white. Yet, all seven chancellors that have served CUNY since 1960, including the current chancellor, James B. Milliken, have been white. And six of them have been men. Out of the 11 co senior college presidents, six, more than half, are white, while only three are black and two are Puerto Rican. Out of the seven community colleges, four, again more than half, are white. And finally, all of CUNY's five graduate school deans are white. These numbers beg us to ask, what is preventing CUNY from hiring chancellors and college presidents that reflect the diversity of its outstanding student body, not to mention that of New York City? and whether there are issues in its search and hiring process that prohibit any efforts to do so. CUNY was established with explicit legislative findings that recognize, quote, an imperative need for affirmative action, end quote, and that its personnel should, quote, reflect the diverse communities which comprise the city and the people which comprise the people of the city and state of New York, end quote. Moreover, the intent of these findings, quote, should be evident in all the guidelines established by the Board of Trustees, end quote, including specifically hiring. CUNY's Board of Trustees has unfortunately, in my opinion, instituted a cloak of secrecy around its search committee's solicitation and consideration of candidates for university chancellor and college presidents. Indeed, the board's standing policy for presidential searches and more recently, amendments to its policy for chancellor searches approved just this week, provide that the work and communications of the search committee shall be conducted confidentially with the understanding that committee members are not to reveal any information concerning the identity of candidates, the contents of its deliberation, or any other aspect of its work to persons outside the group. In addition, CUNY's Board of Trustees is guided in part by the statement of affirmative action that expressly values, quote, diversity and inclusion, end quote, and purports to encourage applications from individuals with disabilities, veterans, women, and those from traditionally underrepresented groups, end quote. However, standing policy for presidential searches and more recently conforming amendments to its policy for chancellor searches approved just this week chose to single out Italian Americans as included among the underrepresented groups from which applications would be encouraged while not bothering to mention blacks and Latinos who comprise more than half of CUNY's undergraduate student body. This reads insensitively, especially when, when one considers that of the seven community college presidents, four identify as white Italian Americans, while only one is black. For centuries, 
African Americans have been excluded, marginalized, and locked out of positions of leadership and authority by virtue of the systemic racist policies embedded in institutions and the systems of this country. Too often, attempts at affirmative action are challenged, diminished, and eliminated. And so the disparity continues and the gap widens. Even today, with their uh, policy, written policy for diversity and selection of faculty, we continue to see a trend that has not increased the number of blacks in full-time positions and at senior administrative levels. The old boy network appears to still operate and blacks are not receiving appointments to professorships and top level leadership positions. At this hearing, I'm interested in learning about the process by which CUNY hires a new college president and university chancellor. With transparency in mind, the committee intends to better understand why CUNY's implemented a policy of secrecy around the, surrounding its search process and how it seeks community input. For example, the Board of Trustees appointed Vincent Boudreaux, a white male, as interim president of City College in October 2016 while it conducted a search for more permanent replacement. However, when it became apparent to the surrounding Harlem community that this appointment would be made permanent, there, this disappointed a number of influential and prominent African American leaders because their insight, their input, and influence had not been sought in the search process. Indeed, the faculty union, PSC, similarly expressed concern regarding the secrecy of these searches and the fact that finalists do not even participate in any public meetings with the community, staff, or students. And finally, the committee hopes to gain insight into the outreach methods, especially as it relates to candidates of color, other than Italian Americans, and how CUNY's legislative and policy-driven commitments to diversity and inclusion actually play out in the process. I would like to now acknowledge my colleague who is here. This is his first meeting, Councilmember Holden from Queens. New members of the City Council, we welcome you. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And thank you to the panel assembled here to, for today's oversight hearing. I'm honored and privileged to sit on my first committee hearing. And it couldn't be more important, uh, a more important committee to start my term off with. Uh, as a former CUNY professor, the oversight authority vested in the Higher Education Committee is of, of vital importance to, to me. I appreciate all the efforts CUNY has undertaken to provide a quality of education for a reasonable price. I believe firmly in the necessity of higher education and even more specifically in technology. I taught graphic design and technology at City Tech, which is right across the river here. And I want the next chancellor and president of CUNY to support technology programs in all of the CUNY colleges. Um, the best city in the country should have the best university in the country. And the first steps toward that, this starts today with this oversight hearing on hiring a new chancellor and college president of CUNY. Um, thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you so much for the introduction. Thanks. You're welcome. Uh, I would like to also acknowledge uh, the staff that has worked to put this hearing together. My chief of staff, Joy Simmons, Mr. Omawali Clay, my CUNY liaison, uh, also Indigo Washington, the director of legislation, Chloe Rivera, the community policy analyst, Jessica Ackerman, the committee senior final, uh, finance analyst, and Mr. Paul Senegal, counsel to the committee. At this time, we'll call the first panel. And it's going to be the Director, Executive Search and Enrollment Services of CUNY, Malette Tusege. And you can correct the pronunciation when you come forward. Welcome. If you would raise your right hand, I'll ask. You can have a seat. Raise your right hand, and I will ask Mr. Senegal to swear you in. Uh, in accordance with the rules of the council, I will administer the affirmation to the witness from the mayoral administration. Do you affirm to tell the truth, 
the whole truth and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to the council member's questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you can pull the mic. Pull the mic a little closer, make sure it's on, and you can give your testimony. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Barron and members of the City Council Committee on Higher Education. I am Mahalit Sagaye, Director of Executive Search and Enrollment Services at the City University of New York Central Office. A major part of my responsibility is to coordinate and assist the university in its executive level searches following guidelines set by the university's Board of Trustees. I am here today to provide you with an overview of the processes and guidelines <coughs> that are followed when hiring a new chancellor and a new college president. The executive search process is conducted in accordance with guidelines and bylaws established by the CUNY Board of Trustees. Over the years, the board has revised some of these guidelines. The Office of Executive Search falls within the chancellery and is tasked with working closely with the board office, the chair, and members of the search committees, search firms, and CUNY colleges within the purviews of these established guidelines. In addition to myself, there is one additional full-time employee in the Office of Executive Search. The total current year budget for the office, including salary, fringe benefits, and other than personal services is 245,000. The CUNY Board of Trustees has a set of guidelines for the university to follow while conducting chancellor searches and a set of guidelines to be followed when conducting searches for presidents of CUNY colleges. The latter also includes the search for the Dean of the CUNY School of Law, the CUNY School of Professional Studies, the CUNY Graduate School of Journalism, the CUNY Graduate School of Public Health and Health Policy, and the Macaulay Honors College. For the most part, the language and the guidelines for searching for a new chancellor and that for a new president mirror each other with a few exceptions that I will highlight below. The university partners with search firms when conducting chancellor and presidential searches. I will outline the process undertaken in the selection and hiring of search firms further down in my testimony. The chancellor and presidential searches are chaired by members of the Board of Trustees. In the case of chancellor searches, the board guidelines call for at least five members of the Board of Trustees to serve on the committee as appointed by the chair of the board. In addition, and I quote, the chair of the board will serve as the chairperson of the search committee and the vice chairperson of the board shall serve as the vice chairperson of the search committee. The guidelines also call for two faculty members, including the chairperson of the faculty senate, two students, including the chair of the university student senate, an alumnus of CUNY, and two CUNY presidents for a total of up to 16 committee members. For presidential searches, which also includes the deans of the various independent schools within the system, the current guidelines call for up to five trustees, three tenured faculty from the college or schools elected as determined by the appropriate faculty governance body, up to two senior level administrators and or representatives of external constituents recommended by the chancellor and appointed by the chairperson of the board. The total number of appointed trustees, senior level, level administrators, or external constituent representatives shall not exceed five. Two students from the college, an alumnus from the college, and a president of another CUNY college. In addition, the search committee for the dean of the law school, the graduate school of journalism, the graduate school of public health and health policy shall include a member of the school's board of advisories, advisors or advisory council and up to two other outstanding figures of the re relevant professional community in New York City as appointed by the chairperson of the board. A presidential search committee thus consists of 11 to 14 members. Let me outline for you in broad strokes the life cycle of a search and the roles played by the committee, the search firms, the colleges, and the Office of Executive Search. I trust getting an overview of the steps from launch to hire will provide a better understanding of what is involved. The guidelines require that, quote, when a vacancy for the position of president occurs or is certain to occur, the chairperson of the Board of Trustees shall, after consultation with the chancellor, establish a search committee to seek a new president. 
For obvious reasons, the guidelines for the Chancellor search do not reference consultation with the Chancellor. As mentioned above, the college's faculty and student governance are tasked with selecting the faculty and student members of these commu committees following their own governance procedures. The chairperson of the board and the chancellor consult with the college and select alumni representatives. They also select one president for presidential searches. For chancellor searches, the chairperson selects two presidents, one from a baccalaureate granting institution and one from a community college. For presidential searches only, the guidelines also call for the selection of senior level administrators from other CUNY institutions and or external constituents. Parallel to the formation of the committee, an RFP process is developed and search firms with experience in this particular area. Example, some search firms focus on community college searches versus senior colleges. Some search firms have more experience working with law schools, etc. are invited to submit proposals. Proposals and firms are reviewed in various categories, including a firm's track record and experience with a particular type of search, a firm's commitment to diversity. Search firms are asked to provide evidence of their dedication to diversity in terms of recruiting and building diverse interview pools and placements, the quality and breadth of services provided, their proposed timeline and whether it meets the university's need, needs and costs and other criteria. Based on these and other criteria, the chancellor and the board for chancellor searches selects the search firm. Once the search firm is selected, the Office of Executive Search works with various units within CUNY, including the legal office and the budget office to secure the necessary approvals. The search firm that has been selected for the upcoming chancellor search is Isaacson Miller, a leading national firm with deep experience in conducting higher education leadership searches. The contract between CUNY and Isaacson Miller has been registered by the Office of the State Controller and comes after a request for proposal solicitation and evaluation process conducted by the university. All expenses for the chancellor search will be paid with tax state levy funds no city tax levy funding will be expended for the chancellor search. For presidential searches, the colleges also appoint a search liaison to work closely with the Office of Executive Search for the duration of the search. This individual, who is campus-based, serves as a conduit for all communication from the search committee to the college, facilitates campus visits for the search committee and for finalists as needed, works with college constituents to ensure approach, approach, appropriate protocols are followed in the selection of faculty, students, and other committee representatives, and serves as a coordinator of college data and information necessary for the development of the advertisement and position profile. After the committee has been fully identified and confirmed, typically a joint announcement from the chair of the board and the chancellor for president's searches is sent to the college community announcing the launch of the search and the members of the committee. For presidential searches, the Office of Executive Search works with the campus to schedule a kickoff campus visit for trustees on the committee, search consultants, and staff. This group meets with the various key constituents, including faculty, students, cabinet members, and staff. The visit typically culminates with an open forum where any member of the college community is free to participate. Feedback from the campus visits provides insight into the culture, needs, etc., of the college and informs the position profile documents and advertisement. At the very first committee meeting, the chancellor, the university chief diversity officer, and the chairperson of the board of trustees, when schedules allow, charge the committee. They outline their expectations of the committee, an ideal timeline, the needs and strengths of the institution from their vantage point, and the characteristics of the candidates they would like to see in the pool. Typically, two major themes are identified and emphasized at these meetings and throughout, confidentiality and diversity. Confidentiality is key in this process because many of the ideal candidates are individuals who are currently holding high-level positions. If their candidacy becomes known, not only would it jeopardize their position and careers, but could also compromise CUNY's ability to recruit robust and rich pools of diverse candidates for the search on hand and for the future. Committee members are selected by their constituent groups to be their voice on these committees and are asked to pledge confidentiality. Regarding diversity, um, I won't quote the language because the chair has, but there is language in the bylaws that um, address diversity. What I will say is um, that 
when a presidential search committee is first convened to receive its charge from the chancellor, the chancellor is also joined by a representative from the Office of Recruitment and Diversity, who provides the committee with an overview of the ethnic and gender breakdowns of individu individuals holding similar positions at the university and pointing out gaps the committee should try to bridge. The charges also includes how to diligently work against unconscious biases and guides guidance and provides guidance on appropriate interview questions, etc. Furthermore, the committee and the search consultants are asked to ensure that the job vacancy is posted in a wide array of outlets to reach as wide an audience as possible. Throughout the search process, the committee continually solicits and welcomes suggestions of potential candidates and nominations, as well as for additional outlets in which to post vacancy notices. Going back to the life cycle of a search, the next step, step is for the search committee to develop a detailed search timetable, including a schedule for future meetings. The Office of Executive Search works closely with the search chair and the search firm to develop and facilitate a draft ad, ad placement strategy, position profile, et cetera, and secures appropriate data from the college and CUNY units for the development of these documents. Once the committee reviews and finalizes an ad, with input from the Chancellor and the Board of Trustees as required, the Office of Executive Search works with the search firm to have it posted on various appropriate outlets. Increasingly, this is done electronically. The next step is to develop and finalize the position profile, which is a much meatier document and provides an overview of the institution, highlighting unique strengths and challenges. It includes demographic and budget information and is meant to provide potential candidates with a 360 degree view of the current state of the college and serves as a major recruitment tool. In addition to being sent to potential candidates, presidential position profiles are also sent with accompanying solicita solicitation letters from the chancellor or the chairman of chancellor searches to higher education system and college heads nationwide, asking, asking them to identify and nominate individuals they think could be a good fit for the position. Nominations are encouraged from the college and university community, but also from other stakeholders and from the larger community. Applications and nom nominations are typically submitted electronically. A password protected secure website is created where applications, supporting documents and nominations are uploaded. Only committee members and appropriate staff are given access to this site. During the course of a search, the search committee holds several face-to-face -face meetings facilitated by the search consultants who provide critical background information on applicants typically not apparent in the submitted documents. The consultants also provide information on some individuals who are reluctant to formally declare their candidacy and work with the committee in strategizing ways to interest such candidates. Sometimes a phone call from a trustee member or a faculty colleague might help things along. Through this back and forth, the committee typically identifies eight to 12 potential candidates for interviews. The committee, with the guidance of the search firm, develops and finalizes interview questions and themes. Interviews typically take place over one to three days and in the interest of confidentiality are held at undisclosed location. Once all the interviews have been conducted, the committee selects typically three to four finalists. On occasion and when appropriate, the committee is also tasked with doing some confidential first round referencing on candidates. For presidential searches, the chair of the committee then communicates the decisions of the of the committee to the chancellor. The next stage of the process for presidential search searches is for the identified finalists to meet with the chancellor and the chancellery and to visit the campus where they meet with the various constituent groups. Campus groups are then asked to provide their feedback to the chancellor. However, and I now quote from the bylaws, after consultation with the search firm, if the chancellor determines that campus visits would inhibit the generation of a suitable pool of excellent candidates, the chancellor may, with the approval of the chairperson of the board, modify the college consultation process as follows. Each finalist shall meet with a group of representatives of college constituencies, including but not limited to elected faculty and student governance leaders and alumni selected by the chancellor. Following such meetings, these representatives shall meet and provide the chancellor with a report on their views of each candidate. The work and communication of those groups shall be conducted confidentially with the understanding that the members of each group are not to reveal any information concerning the identity of candidates and content of its deliberation or any other aspect of its work to persons outside the groups. At this juncture, 
the search consultants and the Office of Executive Search finalize the background checks and referencing. For presidential searches, the chancellor then assesses the feedback received from the various sources, engages in negotiations with the candidates, and prepares a recommendation to the board. After the board has acted upon the chancellor's recommendation, the chancellor notifies the finalists and a formal letter of appointment is issued. For a chancellor's search, the committee is tasked with identifying approximately seven individuals to interview. Once the committee identifies a small group of semi-finalists, these semi-finalists are interviewed by the full board and a finalist is selected in executive session of the full board, followed by a public announcement. I trust this provides you with a better understanding of CUNY's search process when hiring a new chancellor and college president. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Would you pronounce your last name for me again? Sagai. Sagai, okay. Um, and your title again, and how long you've been in that position, and how many searches have you participated in? Um, my current title is Director of Executive Search and Enrollment Services. I've been in this position since 2009. Uh, regarding your last question, I don't have the numbers off the top okay. of my head, but I've been in involved in 2009. So you've participated in both presidential and um, chancellor searches? Correct. Now you talked about the search firms that uh, are used and how you do an assessment as to what their qualifications are. The firm that you've used now, can you talk about how they were selected and why they were selected and what's in their track record that makes you feel confident? So let me just start off by saying that I am not the person who makes the determination of which search firm to, okay. to select but I know that when, they, um, when the university solicits RFPs, there are certain criteria that uh, the search firms are asked to address. And I do have people from the contact office who can perhaps answer more detailed questions about the process. But what I've outlined is pretty much what I know happens. Okay, so if those persons are here? Yes. Okay. Karen just Christian. come up and have a seat, and uh, I'll ask, the attorney to swear you in, and if you could answer those questions, I'd appreciate it. Would you please raise your right hand? Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee, and to answer, to, and to respond honestly to council members' questions? Thank you. Thank you. If you would give us your name, and then if you could answer those questions. My name is Karen. Is your, is your mic on? And pull yep. it a little closer. Thank you. My name is Karen Christian. I'm Deputy Director of Procurement out of the Office of Budget and Finance at CUNY Central Office. Okay. And so as in the selection of the firm that you will use in terms of uh, having them participate in the search, what criteria helps you select one firm as opposed to another? Okay. So our RFP process was a competitive solicitation which was open to all executive search firms. We had minimum requirements in terms of certain qualifications that a firm must meet in order for us to consider them as a potential firm for executive search. And those minimum qualifications were that they must have completed at least three contracts for executive search and recruitment services with institutions of higher education within the last three years. And they must have been providing executive search and recruitment services for at least five years prior to the submission of the proposal. Once we received proposals, we had a selection committee of three individuals representing the, the um, central office and the colleges, and they each independently reviewed all the proposals that we received. We received a total of eight proposals. They re reviewed the technical proposal that was submitted, and we had specific questions within the RFP document that they had to respond to, which helped us to further evaluate and document their capability and experience of an, of an executive search firm. They were then scored, and then there's the cost aspect of the proposal, which we also add that scoring into it. And then we have an oral presentation where the firms that have been shortlisted, and the firms are shortlisted based on the combination of their technical and cost scores, and those that scored like the top four scoring proposals would be brought in for oral presentations. The committee has an interview with each one of these proposals, and then they're scored, 
and then the overall total score, whoever comes in with the highest score would be the firm that the committee would recommend to move into award for these services. What consideration is giving, given to the ethnic competition, composition of these firms? Is that a factor at all? You know, I'm concerned about the old boy network, which everybody knows still exists. Right. So what consideration and what criteria uh, is given to uh, evaluating? Well, we evaluate based, we, it's an open evaluation, meaning that any firm can choose to respond. And then we pretty much would evaluate based on the experience and qualifications of the firm. We don't, at this point in time, look specifically at what their makeup is, but we do have what is called a diversity questionnaire mm -hmm. form that they have to fill out, which gives us some background into how diverse their firm is. And part of the requirement for this um, RFP is that when whichever firm we selected, they must provide us with a diverse pool of candidates for whichever search can work they'll be conducting for us. In terms of the diversity questionnaire, yes. can you give us some idea of some of the questions that are asked of that firm that would help you determine their? Sure. Well, the diversity questionnaire, it's a standard form that's created, I think, um, out of the ESD department up at the state, and it's reviewed and evaluated by our director of MWBE, and I'm just, we're just looking to see if I have a copy of some of the questions that we ask are, does your company have a chief diversity officer or other individuals who is tasked with supply diversity initiatives? What percentage of your company gross revenues was paid to New York State certified minority or women-owned businesses? What percentage of your company's overhead um, or yeah, overhead was paid to New York State certified minority and women-owned business enterprises. Does your company provide technical training to minority and women-owned business enterprises? Is your company participating in a government-approved minority and women-owned business enterprise mentor protege program? Does your company include specific quantitative goals for the utilization of minority and women-owned business enterprises? And does your company have a formal minority and women-owned business enterprise? And does your company plan to enter into partnering or subcontracting agreements with New York State certified minority and women owned business? In addition to this, most of our solicitations, we require 36% minority and women owned business participation and SDBOB's participation. So when you say 36% participation, 30% for minority and women owned and 6% for service disabled veterans. So that's the minimum that you're uh, requesting for the organization, for the companies that are applying? Yes. And so in terms of the company that you selected, the firm you selected, all of those questions that you recited to me, um, they had a positive answer to all of those questions? No, not, I can't remember often, but I don't think they had positive responses to all of them. So, were there other firms that uh, submitted a response to the RFP that might have had a higher score in that area? I'm trying to get to the reason why we don't have blacks in higher positions in CUNY. So if we have a questionnaire that we send to these firms and we ask them to respond, those firms that have a higher score in terms of the responses to this questionnaire, how does that compare with firms that may not have as high a score in the ethnicity question. From what I've seen question. on other RFPs, including this one, yes. firms tend to not score that high on this questionnaire. That's so, a problem. That's a part of the problem, I think, in, our, right. in my opinion. That's a part of the problem. So my question then becomes, what kind of consideration should be given? If we're saying that we have a written policy to improve the number of for, as, as they say, underrepresented groups without specifying la black and Latino. How are we going to address the problem when we're hiring firms that don't in themselves reflect what it is that we want to see? Okay. So I'm, I'm asking you, but you're not the person that makes no, the exactly. policy. You're the person that's sitting there. Okay. Um, can you tell me um, 
what is the pre-search report? Does that still exist in the, in the amendments that were voted on this week? The, that was deleted, the pre-search report was deleted. So can you tell me what is the pre-search report? Is it still used um, and what the content of it is? Um, I'm going to speculate here because this revision, this, the old bylaw, as you know, has been there since 1991 right. or something. And this was, so I, I believe the pre-law report was probably the announcement. I don't think there's anything beyond that. And um, so I, it, that, that doesn't sound to me like a report. Yeah. I will have to get back to you on that. I'm not sure what that statement was. Okay. And how many groups, how many firms submitted, how many groups, uh, firms responded to the RFP for the last uh, announcement, which I probably would, is, would be City, City College? Do we know how many firms responded? Um, so for the city college, I, I think I, I'd rather get back to you on that. I'm not 100% sure. I can get back to you on that. Okay, so for the city college presidential search, do you know how many individuals submitted uh, applications for consideration? Um, I would say well over 30. Okay, and over 30. What is the ethnic breakdown of those applicants that submitted uh, for the city college position? I don't have that information on me, but we can definitely get back to you. Can you tell me where the announcement for city college specifically, since that's the most recent, can you tell me where those announcements were placed? The, the, where the ads were placed? Yes, yes, where the ads were placed. Okay, if you bear with me for a second. I'm going to dig through my papers. Okay. Um, so we had placements and Association of Asian Studies, Asians in Higher Education, Blacks in Higher Education, Chinese World Journal, Chronicle of Higher Education, the CUNY Job Board, Diverse Issues in Higher Education, Higher Education Recruitment Consortium, Hispanic Outlook, Higher Ed Jobs, Inside Higher Ed, the Isaacs and Miller website, which is the firm that was used, LGBTQ in higher ed, LinkedIn, Monster, the New York Times, Simply Hired, and Women in Higher Education. And of course, the CUNY website as well. So of those that, you, that I was able to jot down, there were specifically, I, I thought you mentioned two perhaps that were Asian, one black, one Chinese, um, the diversity issues, mm -hmm. publication, LBGTQ, women, and CUNY. So were there any that were sent to, uh, do you send them, do you send the announcements to black institutions themselves? Do you send them to well, we sent, um, as part of the solicitation process, we, the chancellor sends out a letter to the heads of higher education institutions, colleges, universities okay. throughout the so nation. So he sends a letter. Yeah, and attaches the, the ad and okay. asks for input from okay. all higher education institutions. Okay. And I do want to acknowledge that we do have a testimony from the chancellor, which he has submitted for the record. So I do want to acknowledge that he sent that. I've got lots of other questions, but I'm going to, Pause now and give uh, my colleague an opportunity to ask questions. The, the, the uh, search firm, do they actually, besides looking at resumes and uh, getting the list of people that are applicants, do they actually go out and recruit and, and um, actually contact the person that this might be a great candidate and they Absolutely. actually reach out to people of color? Yes. In fact, um, in many times the people who make the candidates that we look at are not necessarily the people who apply for the positions. They're posi people who sort of made to think about this position due to these conversations. So they're not people who've automatically applied. They're people who are happy in their positions and are reached out to because people feel like they'd make a better fit for this position. So they have actively recruited by the search firm. 
Okay, uh, on the, um, the questionnaire for hiring a search firm, do they act, does anybody check the questionnaire for accuracy? Like, sort of like a resume. You can put anything on the resume, but if it's not checked, it gets by. To some degree, yes. How? Uh, by their track record. I mean, we know what placements they've, they, they've had. They will report to the committee on uh, places that they've uh, made placements. So that way we verify their, uh, or are you saying do they, they do you cross-reference cross every item on Well, you can't, uh, obviously it's difficult to check every item, but the, the items obviously that are very, very important to a search, a fair search, you'd want to focus on. Yeah. And check the company, actually, I'm not saying you visit the company, but it could even get to that at, at a point where, let's check these, uh, these answers for accuracy. And it's very, very important because, uh, as you know, people do, sometimes not tell the truth, or companies do that. So we need to have oversight on that. And, and I think that's, is that done uh, from your, uh, in your area? Uh, extensively? No. No. Not extensively. Okay. Can I just um, add to that? It, part of the process in selecting firms, we do reference background checks on them. We reach out to other clients that they've worked with and we ask them a series of questions okay. with rega regards to the information that they submitted in the proposal to verify that it's true and accurate. Le um, one other question. Let's, let's say one company um, selected a ca some candidates and, it, and the search didn't turn out so great. Mm -hmm. uh, the can or the candidate that was selected didn't turn out so great. Um, what happens to that search um, company or search firm? Th does that go back into the pool or do we just take them off the list or we do nothing? Um, so in the past, we have, we, we would probably take that into consideration when we were doing another search. But for the most part, um, in the contract, if a president is appointed by, a, a search firm helps us place a president and the person leaves within a year, that firm is responsible for doing another search. So, and, and that may be not because the president was, you know, it wasn't a bad placement necessarily, anything could happen. Just one, Madam Chair, one other, I have another question. Um, the search firm, um, this is a, um, is kind of difficult, but I know you said that the search firms do reach out to people of color. Um, and again, uh, how many, we need a, we need a kind of like a, a list. Uh, you know, how many people are actually uh, reached and, and, uh, and brought in for interviews by these search firms. So we need to know, if we're trying to create more diversity, then obviously we want to follow through on this. And, and, and if people aren't applying, then we need to go out and, and find them. They're, they're, they exist, let's say. We, we know they exist. So why can't we find them? So we can share with you um, ethnic breakdowns of uh, people who are in the pool, people who made it to the level of finalist, Maybe not the names, but we can provide numbers. Okay, if you get another one. Yeah. Okay. Um, now you said that if the if the person that's selected leaves within a year, that that search firm is responsible to continue to do another search. And does that mean a new contract, new fees, new payments, new? So we have negotiated in such a way it's not a new contract, but the fees may be revised. We wouldn't be paying them the full set of fees. We'd probably just be paying them for the direct fees that they would encounter as a result of that once it's within the first year. What's the average length of, t of time that chance to have served in their positions? I know we've had seven. Is there an average that we're looking at? I'd be speculating, but um, as you know, Matthew Goldstein served for a very long mm -hmm. time before his current president, with his chancellor. So we can definitely get you the okay. numbers, but I don't have the numbers off the top of my right. head. Right, and, and certainly I want to get the uh, information about uh, the ethnicity of the total pool, the semifinalists, and of course the finalists. Um, so 
In, in its policy uh, that was adopted this past week, uh, the work and communications of the search committee shall be conducted confidentially with the understanding that members of each group are not to reveal any information concerning the identity of candidates, the contents of its deliberations, or any other aspect of its work to persons outside the group. How does that improve the process for selecting chancellor? So I, um, I didn't write the policy, so I'd just be talk I'm just giving you my opinion. Um, I think that if people are sitting in very high level positions, they would feel more confident to enter a search process of this magnitude if they know that they're under the veil of confidentiality. I think a lot of high level people would be reluctant to throw their hat in the ring if they know that there's going to be a very public process where they don't, they're not, they're not guaranteed the position. So they'll have to, so that's my general opinion. On that, but, I, but the board came up with that policy, so I can't. But I think the policy speaks to the board, not to the candidates. Is the secrecy also required of the candidate? Because it's not stated as such. I think the secrecy is in protecting the candidate, is my interpretation of it. Yes, but the policy talks to the, the search committee and those who work for the search committee. In serving the confidentiality of the candidates. Right. Your answer seemed to say that candidates might, you know, feel protected by this, but the policy doesn't talk to candidates. Uh, is there a requirement for candidates to not discuss what's going on? No, it's, it, I think my interpretation of it is to basically encourage candidates who might have concerns about their candidacy becoming public, therefore to build a richer pool. I may not be understanding your question. Okay. Um, so what, we know that with City College, uh, the search for the president, there was a big outcry from the community. And I believe it put a halt or a pause on the final announcement of who the candidate was. Do you think that it's important that the community have some kind of input or involvement in this process? We're talking, we're in an age now where people are talking about being transparent. That's the big word now, transparency. So based on the fact that at the last selection of a college president, there was a great outcry against the process, and we're talking about process. Do you think it would be important to, at some point, consider input from the community? This would, you, you'd be asking me for my opinion. Um, as you know, I, I don't draft Correct. the guidelines, so I guess there would be that would be good. That would be maybe a good thing to do. Yes. Okay. Well, we'll. I think we'll prepare that as a question to submit to CUNY and ask them to respond because, as you say, you just have given your opinion, and um, I think that CUNY has the result that it has because it has not, in my opinion, uh, invested enough time and energy. As my colleague has said, there are black candidates that are out there, and for us to have not found them, I think speaks to the fact that CUNY is not being uh, zealous enough to go out and pursue that and be able to do that. Um, we talked about the pre-search report and you're gonna, I would like for you to get back to me and say if in fact there still is a pre-search report and what it does and what its intentions are. And I had some more questions about the finances, if I can just find them. Can okay. And sure. Just one other, I have one other question from before that was, um, you, 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 re you referenced uh, to hiring the search firm uh, on a point system. They, you accumulate a point system to select um, the search firm. How often is that the lowest bidder, actually, mm. uh, on, the, on the, like, monetary? The, the, the lowest bidder comes in, and how often is that firm selected? Would you say half the time? 90% of the time? Uh, I would be speculating, but I would say um, half the time. So half the time, the lowest bidder. So, but they obviously got the most points. Is that it? Or the money comes into it, this a of lot? Of course, money plays a role, but it's not the only thing. It's not the only thing, but it yeah. seems to be almost dominant here at this point. 
So maybe that could be the problem. If it's half the time you're going in the lowest bidder, that seems to me suspect. That if yeah. you said 30% of the time the lowest bidder got it, then I would feel better. Maybe you will feel better once I get back to you on that then. I'm, I'm just, not I'm sure. just hoping I'm just, that we yeah. pick them based on their talents and not the, yeah. the, the price. So part of the RFP process involves best value in, t in terms of that's how we would select the vendor, so it would be based on who can provide the best quality service for the best possible price. So sometimes it doesn't happen that the lowest cost would be the one that's awarded the contract, but there are times where you would get the lowest cost would be awarded the contract. One of the things we do at the end once we've selected a firm is that we negotiate their pricing down to make it more competitive with regards to what's going yeah. on around. Yeah, but you often get what you pay for. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so we've been talking about the search firms. Uh, when, a, when the university contracts with an executive search firm, how is a firm paid? And is it based on a particular length of time on the types of services rendered or other factors brought into that consideration? So there are three aspects to the payment method for the search firms. There is a fixed fee, which is normally um, industry is normally 33%, but for this contract it's at 30% of the comp annual compensation for the proposed position that the candidate is being recruited for. Then you have what is called indirect fees, which is like their overhead cost, mm -hmm. and then direct costs, which would be um, costs associated with bringing a candidate back and forth for interviews, meeting with the firms to discuss the strategy and approach for the search. So what was the dollar amount for this contract, for the last contract that was uh, given? No, the la the president, the president of right. the city college. Um, I'll have to get back to you on the precise numbers. Okay. And what is it for the chancellor's position? So under this contract, um, the firm we negotiated a fixed direct fee of one hundred and fifty thousand. That would be the firm's fee, and then the added cost would be the indirect fee, which would be a percentage of the direct fee, and then the direct costs. Okay. Um, What, what are the funding sources that contribute to the cost of identifying a chancellor? And are they covered through tax levy funds, through state resources, or other sources of funding? My understanding for this search, it's going to be strictly tax levy funding. City tax levy funding? State tax levy. State. No city funds involved? No city funds. Okay. A and... Uh, um, once an individual has accepted pos the position of college president or chancellor, uh, they receive the formal letter and the delineates the terms and conditions of employment. At that time, is a severance package talked about? Is that a part of the contract? The, with the, the negotiations take place outside my office. I have, really, I have no idea of what's involved. But as a search committee, would you know, you wouldn't know whether or not the severance package is a part of that contract that's offered? So no salary, no no part, the search committee is not involved in the negotiation of salaries or those conversations. Who would do that? The chancellor or the chairman of the board. Of course, if it was a chancellor search, I'd imagine. Do you have any information about uh, the former chancellor's severance package, which I think gave him his salary for a year and then gave him an opportunity to do some uh, perhaps research and then gave him $300,000 for the next five years? Do you have any information about that? No. Okay. I've heard of golden parachutes. That one I think is, qualifies as platinum. Oh, here it is, it's in my notes, just so we have it in the record. Uh, CUNY offered a uh, severance package to Dr. Matthew Goldstein, full salary of $490,000, five years, including six months of retirement leave, 
at an annual salary of $300,000 for the position of Chancellor Emeritus. So is that a new position or new, is that just a title or is it work that goes with that or? You don't know? No. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you. So the uh, CUNY workforce demographics uh, issued most recently for 2017 indicates that there is one Hispanic uh, Latino person in the chancellery executive compensation plan. So what are the titles that go with that? Would you know, does it include president, the deans, the vice president, are all of those the titles that fall within the executive compensation plan? Oh, okay, all right, so then those questions won't be asked. Okay, uh, Councilman, any further questions? Okay, good. If we have further questions, uh, we'll put them in writing and we'll submit them to you. We do thank you for coming oh, and offering your testimony. I think. Oh, yes. Okay, good. Um, in terms of the search for the president at Kingsborough Community College, so uh, President Herzig re uh, retired June 2017, and there has been a person appointed as interim president. Um, and he's been the vice president of student affairs since 2014, Mr. Peter Cohen, and he's served in a number of student service capacities. And it says in the manual, the general manual, that an interim president may not serve longer than one academic year. So if the search is not completed within one academic year, how do you fill the position? Do you extend his time? of the interim, or do you put another interim president in? So I'll be speculating again. I suspect that there might be the ch chancellor and the chair might ask, might, might get an extension on that, but I'm not certain. And, and then also according to the manual of general policy, it says that there are exceptions to the guideline for the presidential search process allowed in special situations. and. Um, it says that there can be a shortened process. What would be eliminated from the normal process that would shorten it? Do you know what steps might uh, be skipped? No, I do not. Okay, so we could send that question always. Um, and then I'd like to, uh, we'll also send it to CUNY. We would like to know what are the retention rates of college presidents and we'd like to have it disaggregated by senior and community colleges and by race or ethnicity. Okay, I wanna thank you so much for coming and giving your testimony. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, and we'll call now our next panelist, and that person is Fern Chan from Continuing Education Association of New York. Thank you, if you'd raise your right hand, the attorney will swear you in. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council members' questions? Thank you. Thank you. You may begin. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, yes. Um, good morning, council members, esteemed colleagues, and members of the public. My name is Fern Chan. Um, I am the immediate past president of the Continuing Education Association of New York. 
I appreciate the opportunity to address you today about hiring a new chancellor um, and college president of the City University of New York. We are a nonprofit organization dedicated to the promotion and support of quality programs of public continuing education in New York State. The association is comprised of continuing education departments across CUNY and SUNY schools and serves as an advocate for the post-secondary adult learner and to encourage the professional development of our members. We were established in 1972, and over the 46 years, we have seen the growth and importance of continuing education across the state and how it impacts the lives of adults and the community. Within the CUNY schools, the continuing education departments across 18 campuses serve over 275,000 adults a year. The role of continuing education and the impact it has on our constituents cannot be understated. Beyond preparing adults to obtain high school equivalency diplomas, we also provide um, workforce development training in key sectors such as healthcare, education, hospitality, manufacturing, and IT, among others. Continuing education not only creates a pipeline into college, but most importantly, responds to market needs with short-term training, building in industry-recognized credentials and certifications. We engage with employers to fill in skills gap for the incumbent workers, as well as train for a new emerging needs and evolving workforce. Continuing education departments are essential to the colleges. We are the entrepreneurial arm of the college, self-sufficient departments funded through grants, contracts, and tuition-based non-credit training programs. Not only do we provide a service to the community, we also give back to the administration to support the mission of our colleges. It is our hope that the future chancellor and any CUNY college president will recognize continuing education as an integral part of the City University system and appreciate our role in their vision for the upward mobility of the disadvantage of the City of New York. Making industry connections with employers, being aware of market demands, and forging partnerships benefits the academic side of the college. It also provides the adult learners who make up a significant portion of the workforce with continuing education primarily, which transforms them from minimum wage to middle wage income earners, provides that bridge to college for those seeking to further their academic pursuits and enhances the skills of working professionals to boost their earning potential. We are seeking new leaders of our university who understand the essential role of continuing education in the growth of the university and the economic development of New York City. Workforce training and continuing education are the engines of economic development for the university and the city, and we look forward to working with the new leaders of the university. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Council member, do you have any questions? I, and I, I know the importance of continuing ed. Uh, I don't think, and I want to get your opinion, mm -hmm. do you think the university actually promotes it enough? Um, do you think they respect it enough? So my opinion would be... In the past? Not to the level that we would like. So I think we lack the administration support. Um, it has come a long way. We have seen a shift, but it would be nice to you know, turn that tide a bit, now that we have an opportunity to bring in a new chancellor to include us in that vision, which has, we've always been somewhat, I wouldn't say marginalized, but not included as such. So it would be nice to have that recognition and also have a more collaborative effort, right, between the college, the academic side versus the non-credit programming. Yeah, so many times, especially I was at a college of technology, yes. and it was so important in our area um, to bring some of the uh, employees from businesses that the technologies kind of left them behind. They needed to um, get an education and not a particularly expensive education. They didn't want to invest the, the time that, that um, academics require. So they had to learn the technology and they'll, they'll certainly advance in their job. That's so important. And yet I don't think we promoted it enough. So I think we need to do that. And I think, I, I hope the new chancellor, I agree with you 100% that the new chancellor should recognize the importance of continuing ed. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. And I also understand the importance of continuing ed, especially in light of the uh, age of technology that we're living in. So we do want to thank you. Thank you. And our next panelist, we're going to call at this time, 
uh, John Adelomu from the University Student Senate. Good morning. If you'd raise your right hand, the attorney will swear you in. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council members' questions? I do. Thank you. You may begin. Good morning, Chair of the Higher Education Committee, Council Member Ines Barron, members of the City Council, and interested community members. My name is John Adoromo. I'm the chairperson of the University of Student Senate of the City University of New York. I was elected and charged to represent the interest of over 500,000 students in CUNY. I'm by virtue of position, seen as a trustee on the Board of Trustees at CUNY, whose responsibility is to govern the university, review its policy, and do its best for the interests of the university. The changes in the Chancellor's search policy was announced as a calendar item of a full board meeting for Feb February 5th, with one he hearing the previous week, of which its location was announced at the very minimum required by law in the central office of the City University of New York as opposed to the regular location of Baruch College for this very hearing of the board. It was also scheduled for the first weekday of classes in which will have played a vital part in turnout as students will have had more pressing concerns as they had noticed the calendar item, if they, even if they had noticed the calendar item in the first place. <coughs> I have concerns with the consideration of the calendar item, um, the Chancellor search policy revisions. Firstly, the University Student Senate was not provided with an opportunity to review the policy and make recommendations prior to the policy being added to the board calendar. This is not the first time the issue has been raised, and it's my understanding that our current um, board chair, um, Will, William Thompson, was assured my pre predecessor that policies would not be brought to the board without providing trustees and USS advance notice to review the policy and provide feedback. Secondly, this, this policy was not considered or approved by any board committee of the board. It has been com common practice that the calendar items be reviewed and recommended by the committee before receiving full board consideration. This ensures that the policy has been thoroughly vetted and received support from several board members. This policy has also um, lacked any involvement of a faculty representative because they did not have a say on the full board meeting. So when policies circumvent the committee process, it deprives faculty members of the right to vote on a policy. And I believe it's the best interest of the university to continue the shared governance and inclus inclusivity of the respective stakeholders. It's what makes CUNY the greatest urban university in the world. The university is housed to the most diverse student body in the world. In the world. But it, that is not reflective of the ex executive positions, presidents, and even professors at the university. Today, only four of our college presidents have black presidents. Only that is only 16% of the system's institutions. This certainly is not reflective of the ethnicity of the student population, which is 25% black, 30% Latino, and wh white, and while only 24% white, uh, identify as white. Um, I quote these numbers on the testimony you, you gave, you were unable to give to the, to the, to the board um, on that very day as you were held down, not held down, but uh, delayed from coming up till the testimony was finished. Nearly 65% of all CUNY staff on the executive compensation plan identify as either white or Italian American. The language of the policy, as you correctly put in your testimony, um, in particular for section 2.3, in which I quote, is innocuous and not clear, de defin definitive statement that specifi specifically identifies black and by extensions, Latinos, as groups that are encouraged to apply. To the contrary, it singles out Italian Americans and encourages them to apply. For the university chancellor's mandate in 1976, the Italian Americans are designated an of official affirmative action category within CUNY, in addition to black, non-Hispanic, African Americans, Hispanics, and all the traditionally underrepresented groups. However, the act is amending the section to single out Italian Americans in this way, reads insensitively, especially in 2018 when 65% of the CUNY student body is black and Latino. When I requested the, both the chair of the board and the general counsel the reasons for the changes to the policy, I was told 
that is to reflect the recent updates of the presidential search policies. I was surprised that a policy with such great impact on the future of the city was hurriedly changed without the what I would consider due process. It was not mandated by law to be to be changed and and the reason and the strong reasoning for which was a main factor was that subordinate policies were changed in, in previous years. It does not make any sense to me as to why these changes were being made in general. The last time these changes were being made in the mid nineties, um, and I understand that that's probably outdated. But you don't wake up and change the policy overnight because you haven't changed them in two decades. You still give it a due process. You do not make drastic changes to policies or laws in any form of governance simply because someone feels two decades is too much of a time to keep the same law. Taxes law will have been changed by <laughs> with that argument. All, all, all laws will have been changed with that argument. Um, this is the argument that I think is not very feasible as to which many other changes the university have been made. And I would definitely be coming back to the city council to testify about that. And as of yesterday, I was appointed to the Chancellor's Search Committee by the Chair of the Board, as required by the current university bylaws by virtue of my position as Chairperson of the University Student Senate. Thank you for this opportunity to present this highlights to you. I hope that my testimony is of use. And if you have any questions, I'm willing to answer them. Uh, thank you for coming. Congratulations on being named to the search committee. We're pleased that there'll be someone uh, with a different kind of bent or understanding as to how we should proceed. We know that you'll be sworn to secrecy, but we look forward to your having your input in that important selection thank of you. chancellor. And as you indicated in your testimony, I do feel that uh, this country, the bedrock documents of this country are what still governs this country. And those bedrock documents do not treat African Americans as full people with three-fifths. They never changed it, so it's still in there. And I think that the policies and practices that institutions and systems still implement today reflect that. So we're looking to have a chancellor that understands the importance of a CUNY education. Um, I'm a CUNY graduate, a proud CUNY graduate of Hunter, class of January 1967, majored in physiology, minored in psychology, and it was the best education. And of course, at that time, it was free, which was the other piece that's added on. I just had to make sure I could get the 15 cents to get the token to get to, to college, and it was a struggle. But uh, we know that CUNY is a great institution, it has great potential, and it has a great responsibility to make sure that it provides uh, a great education to all of those who come through its doors. And we've got to make sure that we pay faculty adequately and that they can be compensated at a rate which allows them to live in this great city and to do the great work that they do. Um, Council Member Holden. Oh, and I see, I'm sorry, we've been joined by Council Member Cumbo. I didn't know that you had come in, thank you. First of all, I want to thank you for your service and thank you for your involvement. It's great to see students involved. Um, what would, what's the single most, um, uh, what's the step that you would take to in increase student involvement in the selection of the chancellor? One, one thing. Um, make it open to the public. Make sure we have public hearings on this matter um, as to what the students would like to see in, in the chancellor process. Not to increase more, like let's say more students on the search committee. That too, but okay. to, to ask for I that asked you for one, but I, I yeah. <laughs> to ask right. for that at this, right. at this moment, I guess, will be very difficult to to push for, especially with the way this policy in the first place was made. Yeah, well, there might be, uh, let's say, a student from the community colleges and a student the, from the senior colleges. There's selected. one other yeah. student selected and, um, who was appointed by the chair of the board that right. will be serving on. Okay, the great. Committee. Okay. Council Member Cumber. Thank you, Chair Barron. This question might have already been asked and answered, but wanted to ask you or perhaps uh, Chair Barron if this question was asked. Has there ever been a CUNY graduate who has served as the Chancellor of CUNY? Really? That's not something I'm very familiar with. Golden? So, I'm, so the previous Chancellor, what I, from what I'm just hearing, <laughs> served. Is CUNY. Yes. Yeah, is a graduate. Is a graduate of CUNY. Thank you. Thank you to the committee and thank you to the panelists for coming and to the audience if there are no other persons interested in presenting testimony.
Uh, this hearing is now closed. Thank you. Thanks, folks.